What is going on guys? Jimmo here again with another insanely awesome video here and by insanely awesome I just mean more awesome than insane, but it's a great video nonetheless. We're going to be spraying that RM Onyx production low VOC solvent I've been talking about. And it's uh, this gem of a Dodge Caravan. We're going to be closing our eyes on the blend panel on little spots like this. But it's going to look pretty hot nonetheless, so let's get to work. Now before we get spraying, let's just back up a bit. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the color matching process with this one because... It's a bit of an older vehicle that's been sprayed a few times and the color does not line up with my spray out deck at all, which it normally does this paint code PBL. And uh, I had to use the spectrophotometer to make some adjustments to the color. You can see this unit here. It takes about five or six readings on average. It can take more or less sometimes, but uh, basically three cameras in there measure the color on three different angles. And it gave me a pretty good match. So I just basically took my standard formula and adjusted it to a better color. So in the past when we were going to mix this up as a waterborne line, we would use these water-based reducers and binders. Now we have the option, the toners all stay the same, and we just swap in some new binders and some new solvent reducers. And it's going to make this paint now react as more or behave more like a solvent than a waterborne line. So it's nice to have that kind of flexibility. So what I'm going to do with this job first is, of course, clean it off and then rub over it with a tack rag. And then I'm going to start spraying. So I have my Iwata LPH 400 with a 1.4 tip. And the little orange tip on it is the Extreme Base Coat one. So it's designed for a base coat. And, um, yeah, so this is actually my first time spraying it. I'm going to be a little bit careful on my first coat. You can see I'm going to put it on fairly light. Um, it is solvent, so it's going to be a little bit more aggressive. And it's not going to be as forgiving on maybe aerosol primers or those kind of cheaper primers you might have gotten away with because, uh, you know, it's solvent. It's a little bit more aggressive. It's going to lift that stuff up. So uh, I don't have any of that on this job. And you can see it's a little bit transparent. It's a blue. Uh, sometimes they can, you know, take a, an extra coat more than a better covering color. So, uh, yeah, you can see that's my first coat going on there. And it dries probably about four minutes in my booth I think it's set around 75 80 but it was flashing off pretty quick and because I know you're going to be asking why you would need both paints both solvent and waterborne and you don't necessarily need both but it's nice to have that option it's more in areas where you can't control the temperature 100% so if you get a really humid day it's going to slow your drying time down significantly so it's nice to be able to just say okay instead of using waterborne today I'm going to use solvent because I can still be productive and get the jobs going through rather than using the waterborne. The waterborne's a little slower so if you're doing a bigger job it's nicer to have that because you want uh, you want the, the time to get around the vehicle to color it completely. So you can see with my second coat it covered significantly better and my first coat probably should have been a little bit wetter. The official recommendations for most colors is actually two and a half coats. So you put one wet coat on, let it flash off, the second coat and then immediately after kind of pull back, dust on another effect coat and uh, then once that flashes off you're ready for clear. And another thing you can do with this is lay down an orientation coat first. A lot of the people I've talked to that are using it have uh, neglect to do that so I'm gonna try it on one of these jobs and see it's more more of an issue on the high metallic silvers and golds where you might be chasing a halo or something so you want to kind of fill in the scratches before you start painting into it so I'll, I'll explore that option a little bit down the road um, for here blending was not an issue it stepped out pretty effortless effortlessly and uh, you know pretty happy with the way the blend came out here So here is the effect coat going on and it's basically just a dusting over everything and what it's going to do is even out all of the metallics and shift the color to the proper position because if you put on your product too wet you can actually end up with a different color. So this kind of gives you a way of having a consistent color match to match your spray out cards and uh, you know what you're getting when you spray it and uh, do your effect coat at the end.
And here's just a quick look at the bumper on the other side. And I had to do a little bit of a repair on it because uh, the prep work wasn't quite up to snuff. And I was able to wet sand this base coat again, which is nice because you cannot wet sand waterborne. So if it's in the booth and you need to take out a dust nib or whatever, you have to do it all dry, which can create dust. And it doesn't sand quite as nice. So this sands significantly better when you're using the solvent. And I have another new product here to show off, which is the DC21NB, which is the 15 minute um, polishing clear. So basically I can spray this job, and if I wanted to or needed to, I could denib it and polish it within about 15 to 20 minutes. I don't know that I would actually do that, but uh, I'll probably do a video down the road just kind of experimenting with it because I don't know. I'm sure I believe that you can because the tech sheet says that it's possible and you can feel it and it feels fine after 15 minutes. But my old school mentality is telling me like all hell could potentially break loose if this doesn't go to plan. So I don't want to kind of experiment with this on a job that has to go within the next few hours probably. So uh, it's a pretty nice clear. It sprays a lot like the Glazerit clears. It's a little bit thicker. It's got some body to it and you can see it goes on pretty nice there and you need a bigger tip with it this is the one a 1 1.4 on it so recommended a 1.4 to a 1.5 and it lays down really nice though so it's about three to four minutes of flash time by the time I did this this uh, side here and the bumper it was pretty well ready to be recoded instantly but um, you know I think I had to go mix up a little bit of clear so it took a little bit longer but um, it sprays really really nice Now, typically what I've seen kind of in my experience with production clears is they tend to kind of die back and lose their gloss within, well, not like significantly, but, uh, you know, a little bit. And that usually happens within a few hours, maybe even within 24 hours. But I got to say, this one here seemed to hold up a lot better. And you can probably tell just looking at it, it doesn't really look like a production clear that you might have seen in the past. It actually it holds its gloss really well and it looks fantastic. Uh, you don't want to really push it across too many panels. This is the standard hardener that I've used and doing these two panels it seemed you know it seemed like I was I couldn't take it anymore because it dries so quick and you have to kind of keep that wet edge going when you're clear coating otherwise you're gonna get some uh, dry spray and whatnot so two panels maybe three if you're really quick the temperature is low or if you kind of use a slower hardener. Okay, so here is what we have right after spraying. You can see it looks pretty good. It actually came out really clean. There is um, a few things on that blend door that we didn't fix. So it just kind of based over. So I don't know if that kind of pops out yet. I don't know if, we actually should, if that was captured here or not. But you can see the shine, the gloss looks really, really good. And I'm pretty happy with the way this job turned out. So it's nice. The solvent too, we can tack it in between coats. And when you, I tack that blend area where I, I uh, faded my base out, right where we're showing you now, uh, you didn't feel any of that transition, even though we sprayed it dry. So, uh, you know, it was uh, it was pretty good. I was pretty happy with the way this stuff performed. So you can see the spectrophotometer did a pretty good job of picking up that color. We got a good match from the fender to the hood. And the bumper to the fender, you can see once it's outside as well, uh, looks pretty good. It does flip around a little bit in the light, but uh, the color overall looked great. So... Let's have a look at what's happening elsewhere in the shop. All right, first off, let's have a little bit better of a look at this Jeep frame now that all that clutter's been removed from the other day, and you can kind of get a sense for the damage. And uh, we just got the new frame in, which I'll show you in a sec, but let, let's have a look at this back rail. Now you can see it was whacked there on the hitch, and that whole left rail is just kind of fallen way down there. And uh, that is, like I say, the main re well, the, the reason that we're replacing the frame completely. It's cracked, and uh, yeah, we can't fix that safely. So 
The entire frame is right here. It's now a table for that roof skin for another job right now, but uh, brand new. I'm not sure what the price was on that thing, but I don't imagine it was cheap. Now this silver job here, the front end, uh, I'm a little concerned about it. I'm not going to be spraying it, so I'm not overly concerned about it, but that fender is a little bit tight for blend space in my opinion. Um, you might almost want the door. It's a silver. Uh, it's tough to say. I think that the, the odds are is the color is going to make its way to that edge. You can see this fender. We have the entire thing to blend. Um, we'll probably want to dust a bit of color on the front edge of that bumper or fender because we're painting the front bumper so it's going to match. But uh, I'm kind of curious to see how they're going to make out with that with the limited amount of blend space on the other side. It's going to take one hell of a skilled sprayer though I can say that. So I can give you an idea of what happens to these unibody cars. So we've seen the Jeep with the full frame. We can replace the frame with these unibody things when they get whacked in the back because they're all kind of one structural unit. The quarters tend to buckle and the panels kind of get pushed ahead. So you'll have smaller gaps along it like the door edge gap. You'll see the quarter look like it's pushed in and the deck lid. Um, usually the, the gaps won't line up. That's kind of one of the first visual indications that you have some severe structural damage. So we're going to be replacing that quarter and we'll be pulling the frame so the, the right side there is going to be caved in so we'll pull that out a bit put on a new quarter and uh, that's what happens in a high impact unibody collision lots and lots happening around here but we've got to end it somewhere and that point is going to be here so thanks for watching and don't forget to leave me a message a comment below letting me know your thoughts and subscribe so, till next time, later.